Uh, I have the distinct privilege to uh, introduce somebody who should be known to you all. Um, Chris Rogers currently sits on the Santa Rosa City Council. He represents Santa Rosa City Council District 5, um, which is downtown Railroad Square, the uh, St. Rose Historic District, and Luther Burbank. And just to be clear, he is not our city council representative. That would be Diana McDonald. Um, we have a policy and symposium that we don't closer to the mouth. I get to lecture people on that every Sunday and <laughs> you'd think I would learn. Unteachable. Okay, just to be clear, so Chris is not our representative. That is Diane McDonald. Um, at symposium, we do have a policy that we don't bring in politicians that are running for office representing Oakmont. Um, during uh, that process. Uh, once they're in and we want to have a word with them and we want to hear what's on their mind, then by all means. Um, Chris has been on the Santa Rosa City Council for seven years. Two of those years were as mayor. Um, Chris is currently running for Jim Woods' seat in the California State Assembly. Jim Woods used to represent us. We're now in Damon Connolly's uh, district. So District 2, where uh, Chris is running, is part of Sonoma and Humboldt counties. Um, in the recent primaries, Chris came through as a leading candidate uh, for that seat, um, being vacated by uh, Jim Wood, and we certainly wish him <laughs> luck in November. Okay. Um, before all of this, Chris was a campaign manager and then a senior staff for Senator Mike McGuire. He worked for Mike McGuire and other legislatures, legislators in the California state government for about a decade. So he knows the ropes when it comes to anything uh, political. And uh, we're also um, very pleased that he's speaking to us today without accepting the honorarium that Sunday Symposium usually gives to our speakers. So please welcome Chris Rogers. Good morning, everybody. This is me text testing the microphone as well. How are you all doing? Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me to come and speak. When I first was invited, I think it was about eight or nine months ago when we started planning this, and a lot has changed since then. But we also have a lot more to talk about now since then. So when I first ran for city council back in 2016, it was the most expensive race in Santa Rosa's city council history. You had seven candidates, and you had really for the first time in the city's history what are called independent expenditures that were uh, eclipsing everybody's fundraising totals. And that's really where this story is going to start. When we talk about money in politics and when we talk about lobbying, we have to start with campaign dynamics. How many folks in here are familiar with independent expenditures? Perfect. So I'm going to go way back. So uh, originally, there was a court case called Buckley versus Vallejo that started to shape what in the future became Citizens United. Citizens United classified how we spend money as speech and basically said that when it comes to politics, spending money is your free speech and therefore putting limits on how much of your money you can spend would be an infringement on the First Amendment. It was a terrible decision, uh, and it has continued to play out since then. I think it's now been, uh, it was under Barack Obama's tenure, so I think it was 2009, 2010, when the Citizens United decision came down. But we've seen it have a corrosive impact on our elections uh, from the presidential election all the way down to your city council races. So right now in Santa Rosa, your city council candidates, they have a limit of how much money they can accept from any individual or from any organization. It's $500. $500 is still quite a bit, but it's something that's at least attainable. And when you run a campaign, the more people that you talk to, $50 donations, $100 donations, that all leads to you being able to buy lawn signs, send mail pieces and get your message out. What's happened under Citizens United is you've had what are called independent expenditures that have popped up. Literally, so long as a group does not coordinate with the candidate, they can spend whatever dollars they want. And in 2016, 
we had our biggest independent expenditure in the history of Santa Rosa pop up. It was $300,000 from one individual. Uh, that individual, uh, Bill Gallagher, has continued to play in elections across Sonoma County and now across Northern California. And I'll tell you, I was the candidate that was knocking on doors. We walked Oakmont three times. Because if you want votes in Santa Rosa, you knock doors in Oakmont. Am I right? We knocked on 20,000 doors and we won. We weren't expected to. We weren't supposed to, especially with that much money coming in. It was a $300,000 independent expenditure and $100,000 pretty much for each of the other candidates versus our $30,000 we raised plus door knocking. And that's really where this story was supposed to start when we first started planning this, the ability of active campaigners, the ability for folks to raise enough money, but work hard, and then voters being able to see through that. Uh, what we have typically seen from jurisdictions is a focus on what are called sunshine laws. Because we can't do anything to prevent the independent expenditures, usually we are focused on new disclosures so that at least you as voters can make informed decisions about why an individual or an organization thinks that they need to have an outsized influence on our elections. If, if I can only donate $500, but somebody else is willing to put in $50,000, the public deserves to know what that person's interest is in the jurisdiction that they're representing. It's a pretty simple concept, but it's hard to implement. Then, about six months ago, Jim Wood announced that he wasn't running for re-election to the state assembly. Uh, my wife and I, we've got our first child on the way, due May 25th. I, I came home. I said to her, I said, we do not have to do this. What do you think? And we looked at the field and decided that we needed to do it. Uh, the other two main candidates, one was an extremely wealthy individual who could self-finance their own campaign. And in fact, they ended up putting in $500,000 of their own family money into the race. You also had the chairman of the California Democratic Party who moved into the district to run, had no real connection, had not gone through wildfires, had not gone through a pandemic, had not gone through flooding or any other disasters Sonoma County had. We thought this is really important. We should do this. And as I started to go over to Sacramento and talk to folks about the campaign, the first question they always asked was, well, how are you going to win? They're going to have way more money than you can raise. And I'll be honest, I don't come from money. I Most of the things I've done on city council have been to help people who are poor, who aren't going to donate to campaigns. And I told them, I said, we can break through by having strong candidates who knock on doors, who have community support, and who can raise enough money, even if you don't have the most money. We don't know the outcome of the race yet. Uh, it is between myself and the chairman of the Democratic Party, still too close to call. We're up by 2,500 votes. We'll know more next week. But what we do know is we were outspent eight to one by the other candidates. So the fact that it's even this close proves that theory that that money and that disclosures really is impactful and important. And all of this leads into how this impacts our government because that outsized influence of money didn't just come from donations that were to individual candidates. And at the state level, your donation limit is $5,500, much higher than the 500. It's really hard to find people who would be willing to donate $5,500, uh, but there are some of those out there. We had about 600 individuals donate. We raised about $325,000 and you had four groups that did independent expenditures that wiped out the voice of over 600 people. You had 150,000 came in from the Dental Association. You had 100,000 come in from the California Association of Realtors. You had 50,000 come in from Bill Gallagher. When you think about the outsized influence that these groups have on selecting who their representatives are going to be, it's a significant challenge for our democracy. You lose local voices in that process. And the whole way through this campaign, we were asking the question, how much do local voices matter, particularly in state elections? 
And it's been an interesting and a fascinating one to be a part of, just as somebody who studied political science and has a master's in this and talks about how do we better serve our community. I'll tell you, we do have something coming forward in Santa Rosa that I think will be helpful. It is a requirement that any independent expenditure has to disclose every single interest that they have in the city. If a developer is going to spend more money on an independent expenditure, they have to tell the public, what properties do you own? Where do you expect to be getting this influence paid back if that's the way that they're looking at it? But how do we make sure that the public has that information to make an informed decision is really important. I know you had slides that were going in the beginning that showed how much money is being spent on lobbying. It's an all-time high. And in fact, last year, $4.2 billion was spent to lobby the federal government alone. That's because we see, particularly with the Inflation Reduction Act or the Jobs and Infrastructure Act, not only are they complex laws that take some help for people to navigate, the city of Santa Rosa, for instance, has a lobbyist that we pay. What do we expect our lobbyists to fight for? Santa Rosa to be able to get some of that money, right? Some of that's just a better understanding. But I think when our elections become entwined with lobbying, that's when you really start to wonder about how are we not just having good intentioned laws put in place, but looking at the organizations that are spending a ton of money to get the right folks into office. And that doesn't mean, I always get this question from folks, that doesn't mean that I think that most politicians are changing their worldview based on who is donating. I think that the flip side of that is far more powerful. When you see an open seat and you see, for instance, the realtors spending $100,000 against a candidate, you can be pretty sure that what the realtor's interests are isn't aligned with that candidate. And they don't have to disclose which candidate they're necessarily helping. They can only just tell you which candidate they don't like. When you see health industry getting involved and when you see private for-profit health insurers donating to a candidate, you can be reasonably sure that that candidate doesn't support a single-payer health care system because that is contrary to the interests of the folks who are putting in money. But it's important for us to know that, to have that highlighted. And one of the things that has started to emerge along with independent expenditures is we refer to it as dark money, where an individual or a group will give money to another group that then gives money to another group. And then that group is disclosed as something that you probably don't know what it is Friends of Oakmont or Oakmont voters for such and such candidate, that doesn't tell the public anything about that person's interests or why they are spending as much money as they are. Uh, and so we really need to focus on sunshine laws. There will also be a conversation about eliminating contribution limits. As much as folks have been supportive of limiting dollars in campaigns, there's really not a strong public policy argument why a candidate should be limited in how much money they can raise and spend if outside groups that have far less disclosure and far less exposure to the public doesn't have those same limits in place. All it's really done is shifted the money in politics from the candidate side over into the independent expenditure side. That's actually been a challenge for folks. What we do expect to see over the next couple of years particularly as those dollars that I mentioned, the Inflation Reduction Act and the Jobs and Infrastructure Act uh, starts to expire, is that the amount of money being spent in lobbying will go down, but the amount of money being spent to elect other people will continue to go up. We've seen that over and over again. This assembly race that I mentioned, it was the most expensive seat for the North Coast in its history. Uh, when all is said and done, when all the reporting is done, we anticipate that it'll be somewhere between three and a half million and four million dollars spent for a safe democratic seat to send somebody up to Sacramento. And really, those dollars will highlight what ultimately was the difference between many of the candidates, whether it's health care, whether it's transportation, or quite frankly, even what we saw was Sacramento just wanting to have the person that they were familiar with. 
uh, even when their local organizations were telling them to go with a different candidate. That actually happened about six or seven different times where the local branches of organizations supported one candidate and then the Sacramento branches supported a different candidate. Uh, your, what that means for you, particularly as you start to look at your elections, get out and knock on doors. Make sure you do your research about candidates. If you have not had an opportunity to meet a candidate, try to find an opportunity to meet a candidate. Most candidates do coffees. Most candidates do public meetings. You can reach out, ask questions through email, via phone. And then we have a theory, and it seems at this point to be bearing out fairly well, that particularly in a low uh, turnout election, particularly in a primary, word of mouth matters. I'm sure every single one of you are the kind of person that has 10 friends that when the election pops up, they contact you and they say, okay, who are we voting for this year, right? That matters when you've seen somebody, when you've met them, when you know their ethics. Uh, I think that all of that matters. But politics is not a spectator sport. If you want your candidates that you support to win, you need to get involved. You need to knock on doors. You need to text bank. You need to provide opportunities to try to help to make sure that that wins. Because otherwise, what does happen is name ID wins. Uh, and when you have millions of dollars at your dispos disposal, whether it's independent expenditures or your candidate accounts, that's going to flood the airwaves. It makes it really hard for candidates with less money to break through. Uh, I'll stop and pause there and start with questions to see where folks want to go with this. Uh, there's a lot to it. Uh, but my top level message to you is exactly that. Just get involved. That when you want good laws to be passed, it starts in your elections. And to get good people elected, it takes a community to do that. Questions? I'm going to start with a comment. <laughs> In 2017, Jane Mayer wrote a book called Dark Money, and the subtitle is The Billionaires Behind the Rise of the Radical Right. Painful book, difficult to read, tons of detail, but what an investigative report it was. Dark Money, 2017. Question over here. I just had a quick comment. It seems to me like ever since Citizens United came into effect that that um, basically the politicians do what they were paid to do because they're that's where they're getting their money. Instead of them feeling like they were doing it, they had to please us, they have to please the investors. And it just seems so backwards. Is that, how, how are we ever gonna get rid of that? And is there a movement to change that? Yeah, I think one of the things that I'll tell you that is perhaps at least a little bit hopeful is I've seen pretty consistently since Citizens United that the, matter, the money only matters to a certain extent, that there is a diminishing return on how much money is spent. And then it does start to boomerang on a candidate where their name ID will go up their polls will go up. And then at a certain point, we're all just kind of sick of hearing about them. Uh, and I'm sure that I'm seeing nodding heads, so I know I'm not the only one. When you're watching TV and it's the same ad over and over and over again, yes, you know the person, but do they endear themselves to you in that ad? The current data still says yes, that those people by and large still win elections, that you have examples where the David beats the Goliath but it's the exception, not the rule. The rule is the person with the most money is probably going to win. And that's the way that it's sort of viewed. And it, I think the focus, particularly on open seats, matters because when somebody is rooted in the community, like I'll tell you right now, if somebody spent $7 million to run against Mike Thompson, I wouldn't care. I know Mike Thompson. Mike Thompson's been my representative in Congress. He's done good work on behalf of my community. Folks have loyalty to elected officials that they've worked hard with and that they can trust, not necessarily a newcomer with more money. But the problem really is when you have these open seats. And that's why you see that influx of money to try to win those open seats. Right. 
Um, most of us allocate a certain amount of money for charity every year. Now we also have to allocate a certain amount of money for politicians every year. So do you think that the end result is that charities are being starved because we have to give that money to the political scene? I don't think you necessarily need to give money to the political scene. So I don't think that the answer to beating money is more money. Uh, like I said, I think candidates need to be able to raise enough. But in this instance, for instance, this assembly race, the one that right now is too close to call, but we're, we're winning, we raised about 325, 340, somewhere in there, thousand dollars, which was a stretch. Uh, the other candidate raised $1.7 million. You don't need to match dollar for dollar. If you can knock on doors, if you can make phone calls, if you can text, those are all, th and by the way, the texting, I know it's really annoying when people get a text. We don't text and ask for money, but we do text and we invite people to come have coffee with us. And my grandma, I love her to death. She can't walk doors. She doesn't want to call people, but she will sit there and she will hit send on those text messages for hours because it's a way that she can help her grandson, right? It's a way that she can help a candidate that she believes in. And then she gets in conversations with people uh, uh, as they're texting back. Yes, you have real people on the other end of those text messages. In fact, California state law says you can't mass text. All of those are individually sent. So she has a program that she logs into that it loads your number and it loads the starting text and she hits enter and it sends it. And then she hits enter again and it sends the next one. But then when people start to reply back, she gets into a conversation with them. It's a really low impact way to have a big difference. And quite frankly, when you start to talk about how do you win against big money, you have to be more creative. Sending a mail piece costs eight times more per mail piece than sending a text. So if you're a candidate who has fewer resources, text messaging, and especially if your grandma's willing to do it, nobody says no to my grandma, uh, if your grandma is willing to do it, that has a huge impact on the person receiving the text message. It's much more authentic than sending a glossy mail piece that is perfectly curated based on polling. Um, and I think that that's a way that folks, even if they don't have the resources to be able to donate, can partner with a campaign and really matter. Uh, when we talk about door knocking or when we talk about the old Tip O'Neill, all politics is local, right? Um, going back to you have conversations with people over the course of three or four months. Many of you have places you can put a lawn sign and that helps start a conversation. It helps with the name ID issue. There are ways to get involved that requires more effort than say just raising money and spending it in a campaign. But there are ways that the community can make sure that the money doesn't always win. Has the Supreme Court decision trickle down to this a local level that is just uh, contaminating the local political scene? I wouldn't say contaminating. I, I would say infuriating at times. Uh, so we've seen a number of elections in Sonoma County that have been severely impacted by Citizens United. The city council race in 2016 was harder for sure, but ended up the money didn't win. The smart renewal, the money won. The DA recall, the money didn't even come close to winning, right? Uh, millions were spent and Jill Ravitch was not recalled by, I think it was 80% said no, right? So when we have those conversations about where the money is coming from and that the money itself is defined as the problem, I think really is impactful for the local community. I think that's where people ask me all the time about how important endorsements are in campaigns. I think that's really where some of that comes in. If you get a mail piece that says it's from the Sierra Club or that the Sierra Club is backing a candidate, you know that that candidate's probably good on environmental issues. And you also know that the Sierra Club isn't making decisions based on how much money that candidate can donate or how much money that they expect to get from that candidate once they're in office. There are groups that people trust more than other groups, teachers, nurses, firefighters, those typically are the ones that pull the best with the highest trust level. 
that all spins a narrative and all politics is is narrative. It's who is the person who's trying to do good for their community? What is somebody trying to accomplish? But then the narrative of the money behind it, of what people expect. You've got 2,000 bills introduced in Sacramento every single year. Most candidates are not going to have an opinion on all 2,000 until they're confronted with it. Most people in the public aren't going to be thinking about every single one of those 2,000 bills. But the money will. The money will know what the fights are going to be. They know what fights they're going to try to avoid and how they want to win. And so all of that and defining where the money's coming from, I don't think paints the locals. It just makes it much more difficult. And I do want to say there's a very strong role for independent press in this. When the newspaper is able to tell what's happening behind the scenes, you don't have to just trust the spin of an elected official or of a campaign. The paper can really wade through a lot of that and help give real information for the locals. So got to give a shout out to the Press Democrat. So it seems like the Citizens United uh, decision is the place where the ship got off keel. And so there are a couple of things um, I wanted to ask you about. One is there's a movement called Move to Amend yep. to amend uh, the Constitution so that that Citizens United is void. The other thing is there was a local bill in California, I believe, that was... Um, working to remove foreign investment from corporations. So if a corporation has foreign investors, that they no longer have the, uh, the right to basically influence the elections because how many corporations do not have any foreign investors? So, so that's another kind of path. Could you talk about those things? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you. I'm really glad you brought that up because that's really the next layer down on the Citizens United discussion. I think the general public understands the corrosive impact of money in politics and the way that Citizens United has enhanced that. But really what Citizens United did that is going to have the most lasting impact is it gave corporate personhood uh, the same rights as individuals, right? Uh, and I actually have a friend that lives down in Marin County he owns a business and he took his incorporation documents and put them in the passenger seat and then would drive the HOV lanes. And he got a ticket for violating the carpool lanes and he took it to court and he tried to argue that under Citizens United, he had another passenger in his car. He lost, but it was sort of uh, highlighted how ridiculous the idea that a corporation is an individual and has the same constitutional protections is as an individual. So yes, big supporter of move to amend, but it is going to take a uh, constitutional amendment to really get a handle on it. And one of the challenges is, I think, it, whether it's big corporations, whether it's unions, whether it's other groups, that necessarily don't agree with each other on policy, they've made this work. They're the big spenders. They're the ones who many of those groups don't want to have to spend that much money. But the fact that they can, and the fact that that's what typically wins elections, means it'll be much harder to get consensus across two thirds of the states to be able to amend the constitution. Uh, I think in the short term, more disclosures, whether it's instantaneous disclosures in independent expenditures right now, uh, depending on when they donate, it's either 24 hours that they have to disclose or 48 hours, and especially at the end of the campaigns. That's why you see that big rush of uh, negative campaigning. I'll tell you in this assembly race at the very end of the campaign, uh, the Friday before the election, maybe it was the Thursday before election, we had $100,000 of negative ads from the realtors come in against our campaign. And what they're hoping at that point is, the candidate doesn't have the money to be able to respond or the paper doesn't have the time to be able to explain what happened and that people only see the negative ads. The ones that they sent against us, it was uh, on homelessness. They used pictures of homelessness that wasn't even from Santa Rosa to say that we had done a terrible job on addressing homelessness. 
And thankfully, the paper had time to actually write an article and call out the fact that they were misusing quotes, taking photos that were from outside the jurisdiction. And what I heard from folks after that was, well, yeah, of course, that's a ridiculous thing that didn't sway my vote. But if, if at the end, there hadn't been that level of disclosure publicly, it may have worked. And it may have worked. We'll, we'll still find out in a week. Uh, I think instantaneous uh, reporting, more sunshine, and more education to voters to know what to look for and where they can find that information will help stem the tide. Ultimately, want to see the Constitution amended. I just don't have much faith that that's going to happen anytime soon. Chris, I just yeah. wanted to second OSHA's comment and your comment about move to amend. It's move to amend.org. Yep. So it's it's a viable group. Um, and also, could you please clarify the independent expenditures and why they're not covered? I didn't quite catch that. Yeah, so that's the entirety of the Citizens United ruling. Is it said, it took Buckley v. Vallejo, which said that how you spend your money is free speech, and it applied it to politics. It applied it to elections. And it said that a corporation a organization, even an individual, how they spend their money is protected by the First Amendment. So it, so long as they are not coordinating directly with the campaign, so long as they don't tell the campaign what they're going to say, how they're going to say it, when they're going to say it, all of those things, they can do whatever they want. It's the way that this works over uh, in the federal government and on the, the Sacramento side is typically you have a consultant who is hired by an organization or group, say the realtors uh, are, we're doing this, that consultant is a different consultant than the one who's working on the campaign for an individual. They're not talking, but certainly there's keys, right? They can do polling. Many of them do their own polling to see what's resonating and what's not, how to attack somebody and how not. There's, they can take any public access photo uh, they can look at the messaging from a candidate. It's pretty easy if a candidate is being repetitious with their uh, with with their messaging. It's pretty easy for the independent expenditure to pick that up and run with it also. So they don't necessarily need to coordinate to be able to help. And so long as they're not coordinating, Citizens United says they can spend whatever they want. Uh, you mentioned the positive role of independent press when it's somebody like the press Democrat with integrity and yep. and caliber, what's the role of money with press that isn't of that? Well, I, if I'm being cynical here, and, and and I can be from time to time, having worked in politics since I was 18, I think that that's why Trump and many on the right are so quick to attack the press, because if you undermine the credibility of press, then that means that the money that's being spent, which a lot of it is on the conservative side, uh, has just as much gravitas or just as much sway with the public as a publication does. That's If I'm being cynical, I'd argue that that's the case. I have a question about how best to donate money. My gut feeling has always been that if you donate nationally, the national people can decide who needs it the most. Is if, As a local candidate, do you have access to national money? No. So typically what will happen is you've got a national democratic party, you have a state democratic party, you also have a county level democratic party. So the Sonoma County Democratic Party uh, has representatives from every single one of the supervisorial districts. So you've got five people representing District 1, where you are located, that make the case for which priority races the Democratic Party should endorse in and be interested in, whether it's local donations, walking, whatever have you, that, that time and that focus. So depending on which level you're donating to is how they'll focus it. Then you also have the caucuses. So you have the Senate Democratic Caucus, for instance, that now... Senator Mike McGuire is the head of as the pro tem. You have the Assembly Democratic Caucus. They all are looking at all of their individual seats and choosing which are the priority 
state Senate seats that they need to be competing in or the priority state assembly ones. So depending on where you donate is where a lot of that focus will go. There is a huge focus on congressional seats. Uh, that's for obvious reasons, but you'll also have folks like Congressman Mike Thompson that will adopt a swing district every election where he'll invite people to donate money to that candidate or to go over and walk or support that candidate because he's in a safe Democratic seat. But to be able to get anything done in Congress, he needs a majority of Democrats. So it does benefit us for him to help elect other people. So there's many different avenues depending on what your interest is. Um, me personally, I usually donate at the state level, but then invest my time knocking on doors, making phone calls here at the local level. I'm going to segue a little bit. Yep. Uh, assuming you get elected, uh, you will find yourself in a world where there are a lot of com uh, organizations that are part of the state organization. Okay. And understanding as an individual, if I have a question that needs to be answered by them, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Funny thing, there are lobbyists who do. Okay. So, how do I find out how to actually access information from a state agency? It's a great question, and it's actually one of the vital functions of a legislative office. So right now, your assembly member, Damon Connolly, and your senator, Mike McGuire, they both have staff members that are specialists in navigating that process, whether it's the Franchise Tax Board, the DMV, uh, whatever agency you have, they have direct liaisons that they can work with. So if you as a constituent have an issue or have a question, you can contact their local office and then they will work with their liaison to get you the information that you need or to help you if you're having an issue. Uh, it's one of the primary functions of a legislative office that we don't talk enough about is actually making the state's bureaucracy work for you and making sure that you have the same level of access to it as say a lobbyist out of Sacramento. Getting back to Citizens United for a moment, that was uh, done in 2010. And in the majority opinion, the uh, conservative justice Antonin Scalia said, although he thought that there should be no limits on donations, the public had a right to know who was making the donation. And therefore, sunshine laws that don't fully explore those three or so groups that hide the money, uh, they should be more focused on getting that done. And also, uh, in addition to move to amend, there was a professor of political science at Berkeley. His name is Aaron uh, Belkin. He was the head of Pack the Court. And when asked, well, so if the Democrats are able to get four more justices on the Supreme Court. And then when the Republicans get both the Senate and the presidency, and then they add an additional four, and then it goes back and forth. He said, well, eventually it would stop. But that is a quicker way to get um, the uh, Citizens United uh, case reversed and other things like the John Lewis bill for voting rights across the country. Uh, so all we need is to get a couple of extra seats in the Senate and retain the presidency and we can see some changes positively well ahead of anything else. 38 states have to uh, change the constitution or vote to change the constitution. That is a very steep climb at this point. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I'm open to pretty much anything that's going to help fix the problem. Uh, one of the things with Citizens United that has been really interesting to see is you do have states that have done better disclosure laws. California, for instance, when you have one of those independent expenditure mail pieces come in, it does have to list who the top contributors are. But for instance, if it says California Association of Realtors, and one of their realtors from LA has been significantly funding the association, there's still a level of removal 
where people don't necessarily see why. Um, and so you do need to have better tracking of where the dollars are actually coming from, even when it comes through an organization or a group or a PAC. Uh, right. This might... Oh, sorry. When I went to public school, we had a course called Civics, uh, which were all these things were taught, but apparently they're not taught anymore. How, how can we bring something like that back so the, so the public is informed about how things work? Yeah, I will say, because I hear this from people a lot, some of it is definitely still taught. So I actually started as a journalist when I was in high school. Uh, I was down at Rancho Catati. I did uh, the school paper. I was the editor-in-chief for it for a couple of years and then did journalism when I first went off to, to college. But it was my government class that I had my senior year of high school that actually got me interested in politics. And that linkage between what a journalist does of going out and finding answers mixed with wanting to make a difference in the world was why I, was, I made that transition over. But we do still have government classes. Uh, I don't know if it's just because it's only one year. I don't know if it's because there's a lack of interest. And quite frankly, lack of interest is a really big issue. When you look at turnout, a lot of that is related to people feeling overwhelmed by the 24-7 news cycles around what's happening with politics. A lot of it is people feel overwhelmed by the money. I don't know if you solve that piece of the problem by having longer classes or more classes focused on civics. I think you certainly can add them. There's certainly a lot that I didn't know until I went off to college. Um, but uh, we still do have civics classes. It's just a question of how much that sticks and how people stay interested. Uh, and I will say it's not just young people. I know young people get blamed all the time because they vote at a lower rate. Uh, that is true. But if you look at the voting rates across all age groups, you still have a huge difference between your primaries and your, or excuse me, your gubernatorials and your presidentials, your primaries and your generals. Not everybody votes every single uh, election. And part of that is, People just don't have as much interest sometimes. Uh, we actually look at that when we're projecting turnout for an election is what other interesting things are on the ballot that will get people to show up and vote. And I'll tell you, this primary, the turnout's going to end up around 50%, it looks like, when all of the ballots are counted. There was not a whole lot that was interesting on this ballot. Trump was winning the Republican nomination. Joe Biden was winning the, the Democratic nomination. You had Prop 1 for mental health, which was perhaps the only thing people were interested in showing up on other than their local issues. So I think that that's part of the problem too, is how do we continue to build that expectation and build that interest for, po for folks to show up? Um, I have an observation that the internet has pretty much wiped out local newspapers. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but it's my, my observation. So all of this money that you're talking about, millions and millions and millions of dollars are being spent in the media, correct? I mean, they're being spent on flyers and signs, but mostly it's TV and the internet. So um, we have Fox News here, and I don't think we would have had this same kind of um, dis disparity between the media stations as we have. We haven't had that in the past. We've got it now, though. And isn't all that money going into the media? And isn't the media becoming more and more radicalized? So, and it's good to remember, Fox News was created specifically to make sure that Nixon's resignation never had to happen again. That's what Roger Stone created Fox News for, was to have that counterbalance to make sure that there was that conservative voice that was there. So you're right in a lot of ways. Uh, where do most people in here get your news? Computer. So I heard I heard an MSNBC. I heard a Press Democrat. Press Democrat. TV. TV Where do you think your children and grandchildren get their news? Instagram. I heard TikTok. TikTok. Instagram. The internet. So going back to the civics question, one of the conversation topics that's been pretty interested is how do you teach in schools media literacy so that folks, particularly younger folks, when they're first getting information, learn about confirmation bias, learn about bubbles, and can actually weed through what's real information and what isn't. Uh, that, that's something I'd definitely be interested in. So 
So I think that there's still a role for, I said print media, like the Press Democrat, but even reputable newspapers that have gone to e-editions that are online instead, the ethics and the trust is still there, even if the daily circulation at your doorstep isn't. So how do we continue to do media literacy for folks and provide that access and make sure that people can pick through, you know, <laughs> I, I was going to pick on a, a specific one, but uh, to make sure that folks are asking critical questions about the media coverage that they're getting. And I will also say, how do we make sure that there's enough capacity to cover things? Uh, because we do know it costs money for folks. You're in an AI generation where people have blogs being churned out on topics versus having a reporter who is dedicated, who can dig in and have historical context and weave through the message people are trying to convey versus what's real, that takes money. That takes an actual person to do that. Chris, um, what happens when a candidate like Katie Porter leaves the scene? Does she get money later on if she wants to run again? Is she just kind of goodbye? And uh, does any money um, from either the state or any other funds get to her after they have lost the election, but they may run again for another for the election in four years. What happens? What happens uh, to that? I think she qualifies for unemployment. I right? know, I know. But this is the other critical piece when we talk about money and lobbying is these folks have connections. And I was joking with somebody before. There's a really famous uh, story about. Uh, a gentleman wanting to hire a lobbyist, he walks in the office and the lobbyist says, I can get that done for $10,000. The person says, great, signs the paper, picks up the phone, makes a phone call, sets it down and goes, okay, you're good. And the guy says, I paid you $10,000 to make a phone call. He says, no, you paid me $10,000 because they took my phone call. There are pretty substantial revolving door policies that need to be strengthened. Uh, for me, for instance, when I'm done on the Santa Rosa City Council, I can't lobby the city for a year. Uh, even if I was to take another job that needed, that had interests in front of Santa Rosa, I wouldn't be able to do that for a year, or I'd have to be in the back end and have somebody else having the, the conversations with council members or other folks that I would have developed relationships with as a council member. That's a good thing. Uh, it needs to be longer than a year. And the state has the same laws in place. The federal government has the same laws in place. We actually are in the process in Santa Rosa of updating our lobbyist ordinance. Uh, we were just talking about it at our open government task force a week or so ago. Uh, one of the things that we don't allow is for people who are not registered as lobbyists to lobby council members on specific issues unless they disclose it. That way the public knows who is trying to influence a decision but we don't have the same requirement if they are lobbying our staff who are making recommendations, doing their staff reports, oftentimes are moving projects through the way. So we're, we're gonna add that. So what do, uh, let's call them re retired or recovering politicians do after they lose a race? The answer is whatever they were doing before they got into elected office or something else of similar interest. I can tell you right now, I have a master's in public administration. If I was not on the city council and if I was not running for the state assembly, I'd go off and I'd be a city manager somewhere because I love the local government process. So that's what I would do. I don't know what Katie Porter does. Maybe she goes back to teaching. I just, yeah. So this is a, uh, I guess, a basic civics class question. Uh, lobbyists are uh, in the process. They have been forever, they will be forever, but there are limitations on them. I mean, I'm just asking you what you think about lobbyists. Yeah, I'm actually less critical of lobbyists, I think, than a lot of folks. I, I've worked with a lot of them. I have a lot of friends who are lobbyists, but what it is for them is oftentimes it's expertise. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Yes, we think of lobbyists as the people who are influencing bills and they're being paid to do that. So long as you know what somebody's bend is, you understand how they're trying to manipulate the process. But especially when we have term limits in Sacramento, 
many of the folks who are working in an industry, whether good or bad, uh, whether it's an industry we agree with or disagree with, they oftentimes have a lot more expertise and a lot more historical context than the individuals who are casting a ballot or casting a vote and making a decision. Uh, do I want the lobbyists making the decision? No. But do I think that there's still value in hearing that perspective and then weighing it against other perspectives? Sure. Uh, lobbyists have been a part of the process for a long time. Uh, and most of the time, we're thinking of lobbyists as folks like you know, Chevron's representative. But we also have folks like the Infant Development Association, that they too have a lobbyist who's there to represent the interests of children. Uh, particularly our developmental population that typically doesn't have a voice. So I think so long as your elected official is able to weigh those individual voices, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to have lobbyists involved. You just can't have them running the process. So Rachel Bittacoffer just wrote a new book on democratic messaging or what they should be doing. Yeah, we're terrible at it. Yeah, and she tells you how to fix it. Uh, one of her points is that there aren't as many undecided as people think there are. I mean, if you're undecided between Trump and Biden, it means you don't have enough information. And her point was that it's the low information voters that actually determine elections. What do you think that's true? And what do you think about low information voters? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually have this conversation with David McEwen, professor at SSU all the time. Uh, David says that we don't have undecided, we have liars. That's the, that's the way that he views it, is that even if you are declined a state, even if you are not a Democrat or a Republican, you might have some issues that pull you back and forth. But by and large, most of the population votes the same party most of the time. A little bit different at the local level where you have personal relationships with people, but that there's a very small segment of the population that's actually legitimately undecided in each election. And so I actually would recommend if you ever have McEwen come and speak, he'll give you a breakdown of which counties, not which states, which counties are going to determine the next presidential election because those counties have the most people who are genuinely undecided. And then the rest of it kind of falls in line with expectations. Um, I find that most of the people that I talk to are either apathetic or they have a party that they've chosen. Um, we have in California uh, almost as many declined estates, which is California's version of independence, as we do Republicans. But from a campaign perspective, you know that those declined estates are still going to break out similar to the Democrat versus Republican breakdown at the time that the election or the ballots are cast. Okay. I wonder if you could comment about the influence of various lobbying organizations actually writing the context of bills that go to Congress. You know, you hear horrifying stories that the uh, congressmen don't have adequate staff to write the bills. They're being written by lobbyists. Yeah. Uh, so the lobbyists shouldn't be writing the laws. Uh, and that does go back to not letting them control the process. The way that it works in Sacramento, and it's different than the federal government, but you do have legislative aides who work directly with legislative council and with committee staffers. None of those are uh, paid by businesses, by organizations. They all are paid for by taxpayer dollars. They are part of the legislative process. And so you get your, your bills are mocked up. You work with ledge council, you get your draft bills. Once those are presented, then that's the starting point for many of the discussions. That's not to say that there aren't lobbyists who are involved along the way that can't work with an office to try to get language introduced, but at least there's that public airing, and then everybody has access to the same information before the bill gets voted on. We also have laws in California about how long a bill has to be in print before the legislature's allowed to vote on it. That's so that the public and other organizations and institutions have a chance to look at the bill, to read through it, and make sure that there isn't anything funny going on with it. There are those that uh, advocate uh, term limits at the federal level to get rid of the influence of money. Um, we have it now at the state level. Is it is it working? So, uh, 
I don't believe in term limits. So we have term limits, they're called elections. I would rather make sure that the emphasis is on providing the public with the tools they need to make informed decisions about the job that their elected officials are doing. And if they don't like what they're doing, throw them out. Because otherwise you do have this shift we talked about where power shifts to the institutions, to the people who have been there for decades uh, that are not accountable to the public. And that level of uh, public accountability is really important. There's actually a theory in political science that you have over the course of a term that somebody is in office, you have a diminishing return on or a diminishing amount of uh, trust from your constituents that the election every two years or every four years or every six years, depending on what the term length is, is a chance for you to renew that conversation with the public. I think that when you artificially tell people that they can't have a representative who's been doing a good job and has been accessible to them, shifts power over to lobbyists and shifts power over to staff that have no accountability measure for the local government. Any more questions? Yes, one here. You know, it's uh, tax time and on your tax form, it says, do you want to put, I think it's a dollar toward um, election? Where does that money go? How much is there? And is that a good idea? I don't know, but let me look into it. Um, I, I typically, have never done that, so I haven't looked into it much. Do we have any other questions? I think we have one right in front of you. Then. What did we do wrong? What did we do wrong as a, as a Democrat that we didn't uh, push uh, like the Republicans did a few years back to uh, make sure that we get our candidates in office? What did we do wrong, and what are we doing wrong now? I don't know that I can answer that question specific to Democrats, but what I can answer is from my perspective as an elected official, one of the things that I hear from folks consistently, and I'll tell you with this assembly district, it goes from Highway 12 all the way up to Oregon. So it's Sonoma, Mendocino, Humboldt, Del Norte, and Trinity counties. A lot of it is the area that people think of as the state of Jefferson that's ready to leave the state, right? Because they're so conservative that they hate the rest of liberal California. It, and I actually, I even had a week where I was, I, a couple of days where I went from Sebastopol to Weaverville to Crescent City to Arcata, back to Crescent City, Santa Rosa, and then Sacramento. And, and as I was getting ready to leave uh, Sebastopol, I was telling a group about this trip and somebody brought up state of Jefferson and they said, well, I bet there aren't very many votes for Democrats up there. They don't like liberals. I'll tell you from my time up there, not just as a candidate, but also when I worked for Senator McGuire, most of those folks just don't feel heard. And this might be the perfect end cap to this conversation about money and politics. They don't feel like they have mattered to government. Set aside getting your way, set aside having the person that you want or the issue that you care the most about go the direction that you want they don't feel like they've mattered because people don't go there. Their elected officials aren't there as often. McGuire does a fantastic job. So he's, I hear that all the time that they see him. Uh, but think about flyover states. Uh, and that's the way that we refer to them as flyover states. And we, particularly the Democratic Party, we care about California and New York as the, the bellwethers. And then we fight in purple places like Florida used to be purple, Colorado's purple. We fight in those kinds of places, Virginia. But many of the other states that are red states, we don't invest any time, we don't invest any money in those states at all levels. So why would those folks think that the Democratic Party cares? Why would they feel like they have a voice with the Democratic Party, regardless of if they're inclined to agree with us or not? If we're not showing them that they care, why would they feel that way? And especially when you start to talk about the connection that folks have to their local government, why aren't we investing more in Democratic city council members or in townships in states like Wyoming, right? It, you're talking 20, 30 years out, but those relationships and that could potentially grow into turning the state a little bit 
less red. Uh, so that's that's my one thing. Uh, it's not going to win us elections right now, but I think that those folks just don't feel heard. Yep. Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's an organization here called uh, the Sisters in Sonoma. Her sisters. Oh, I think yeah. there's two of them. I think, and then there's also left of Oakmont, and we're writing postcards, and we're going to take I think uh, Pennsylvania, maybe Arizona, uh, and try to do calls to them. Yeah. So we're we're getting on our feet. So thank you. Well, then going back to the the question about framing and messaging from the Democratic Party, for me, it's also many of those folks, particularly in red states are voting against their own interests. And so better understanding about how we can talk to them about issues and the solutions that the Democratic Party has, uh, I think would be critical. And instead, what we see, particularly in the national media, is people being pit against other people. Uh, when we talk about universal health care, it's people are worried that they're going to be left waiting for a long time to have access to care when those same people that are worried that they're going to wait to have access to care have no access to care because they don't have health insurance, right? Uh, so I think listening to folks about what they need and providing solutions and showing them that they matter, I think could have a big impact. Uh, I, I'd like to reinforce uh, what you just were saying about local councils in terms of red states. I. I was listening in on the caucus for rural Michigan, where we uh, have a home and of Democrats. And they were saying, it, the way we handle the red counties is slowly, each time at the local level, we move the needle a little. Yep. We don't say we've got to win it right now. And we, we come up with knocking on doors and uh, doing some projects that people relate to and listening. And I'm wondering how we could do that in California and the red counties as well. Yeah, part of it's how you campaign. Uh, and it is, to me, it's the, the double-edged sword of trying to win is the way that we campaign is we go talk to the people who vote every single time. This has a tie-in to the amount of money that you have because when you have more money, you can talk to more people who may be infrequent voters. When you have less money and you need to talk to somebody and make sure that they're going to vote, you're going to go to the same places over and over again like Oakmont, right? Uh, in how we campaign with an outcome as the expectation is part of the problem. Uh, I have, uh, on my campaign, we've had one volunteer. He's been a diehard volunteer. He is a Republican through and through, but he supported our campaign because I had lawn chairs out at the Wednesday night market and I was just sitting there inviting people to come have a conversation. And he sat down and he talked to me for an hour. We didn't agree on a single thing, but he appreciated that he had that type of access, right? And, and so there's ways for us to break through the national narrative about Democrat versus Republican by talking to each other and talking to people that we normally wouldn't that just doesn't win elections right now. It's to your point, it's moving the needle. It can help move the needle, but that's why it doesn't get the money or the resources or the time uh, that it needs. But there is an opportunity to do that. And this will be our final question. Um, I have relatives in the South. I'm from the South, very supposedly devout Christians, and they are Trumpites. And everything that that is listed that the Democrats like Biden at the national level are the things that they actually need, financial needs, support, and they absolutely won't even listen or investigate that because something has just, what what causes that? Repeated lies that just become truth over time? So there's, Ezra Klein's done a lot of writing on this, and I'd recommend reading some of it. But one of the things that I think he's hitting on is that the way that social media works right now is taking people's interests and they're turning them into their identities. So you see this all the time, particularly if you have conversations about tough topics like police reform, that 
for folks who are not related to somebody who is law enforcement, oftentimes the conversation's 50,000 foot about police and accountability and about the system. But then for individuals who have a loved one who goes out there every day and is potentially going to be under fire or have something happen to them, it becomes much more personal. And then the way that social media creates a feedback loop is it takes being related to the person to then becoming part of the identity, right? The wives and husbands of law enforcement. And it makes it harder to have a conversation about a very real issue because then that person's identity and that person's loved one feels attacked. And I, and I, I think about that all the time and I use law enforcement as an example, but it's a lot of issues and a lot of issues related to Trump that some of the Trump mentality has been fed to people in a way where it has become part of their identity, where it's on the back of their trucks, it's they're always wearing their red hat, right? That stick it to liberals has become who they're about. And it's a challenge to talk to somebody about you're voting against your self-interest without them feeling like you're attacking who they are or who they've become, right? And there's, there's definitely, when they talk about the ivory tower, there's definitely that I know better than you what's good for you that they hear in that conversation. And so it takes a long time to break through that. And it takes sort of that conversation at the call it in a, in a lawn chair to really be able to talk to folks about it. Um, I don't need to. So my, my grandpa is a conservative Republican from Virginia. Uh, he is a conservative Republican on the economic side. He hates the xenophobia side. He actually is voting libertarian the last couple of election cycles because he hates that part of the identity. He and I can just have conversations where he says, you know, climate change isn't as big of a deal as you think it is. I'll be like, that's fine. You're one vote. I'm doing a lot. I help organize. I can help win elections. I don't need you to know that I'm right. I'll listen to you. I'll disagree with you and we'll move on and we, we've, we're fine. But then there'll be other issues where he and I will be able to have that conversation where he'll be open to my opinion because he knows I don't need, I don't have any need for him to agree with me. I, I don't know how we do that on a national level, but I think those individual conversations can help. I want to thank Chris for coming in. Chris, your fingers are crossed for you. Oh, thank you, Next everybody. Next week, we hope it all works out for you. We hope